are lost in the world somewhere. They showed up in Melbourne. My cousin came today. He got his. But none of us in Stewart got ours. So this is a great crowd with no notice. I appreciate all of you coming out. Uh, you will be getting your newsletters in the next couple of days. Uh, we have a few things to go over, and then we're going to turn you over to Josh. I want to take the time before we start to thank my board, all of them that are here. Please stand up. I see Tonette and Linda. Some of the rest of you have to be here. Tonette, 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 and Alice is out in the hallway, I think. Is there anybody else here? I'm... Alice, raise your hand. <laughs> Okay, um, they have worked so hard this past year. This is a, a wonderful crew that we have, and they work very, very hard. We have a lot of volunteers. We keep the museum so clean that we have people ask us, how do you keep this so clean? Who does all of this? And I have to point at them and say, say thank you, because they do. But uh, it has been a pleasant year last year. We got a lot of comments, and we're looking forward to going on this year with a lot of new, we have a lot of new programs planned, and they will all be coming out in the newsletters that don't show up. So <laughs> plan on attending the second Tuesday of every month until May. Bingo. All right, I'm going to turn this over to Josh Lillard. Who is what, is, what is your title, Josh? Historian and collection manager. And I don't know what the collection manager does, so we'll ask him. I've been asked. It's not part of my job. I'm not the collection manager. Okay. Here's Josh. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. So, to answer the first question of the night, uh, historian and collections manager means I get to do the research about our history, come out and do talks like this to share the history. And as collections manager, when people donate things to us, I get it cataloged and recorded and stored and figure out when someone says, oh, I need some information or some photos of so-and-so, I have to go find out where that box is and pull all the stuff out. That means I get to make some neat discoveries that way, too. <coughs> so if you haven't heard of this before, most people have heard of Jupiter in the Lighthouse and Museum because the Lighthouse uh, down there in Jupiter. We've got a museum about local history there. Uh, Pioneer House in addition to the Lighthouse, but we're, that's actually our, our what we call it, doing business as name. We're the Las Hatcher River Historical Society since 1971. We are the historical society for the Jupiter to Cuesta area. You may not realize the Las Hatcher River, the size of the watershed down there, it is all the way out toward Pratt and Whitney, all the way up into western Hope Sound. So there's a lot of history there from early Native Americans through the present day, and like Stewart, I grew up in the Stewart area. Uh, it's changed a lot up here, and it's changed a lot down there, even the recent history in addition to the older history. So we're talking tonight about Trapper Nelson, not Trapper John, is what we want to call. Trapper lived uh -oh. there we go. up the Lock River. He was born in Trenton, New Jersey, Vincent Natalowitz. Uh, Polish-Lithuanian immigrant family. This is the earliest photo we know of him. You can pick up the, wall, the Paul Lane fellow there in the end. Uh, the, uh, this is, we think, his uh, uncle or brother-in-law. He had a large family. He was one of the younger kids. His main older brother was seven or eight years older than he was. His dad was mistreated in Trenton as an immigrant who didn't speak very good English. Trapper was a bright young man, did not have a great deal of formal schooling, but uh, was good with English, good with math. He would follow his dad out when he would go shopping and make sure that storekeepers didn't try to swindle him. His dad uh, was a mason and a potter, uh, founding member of a church in Trenton. His dad, the, the family information is a little fuzzy. There's indication that his mom died when Trapper was a young child and he uh, his dad remarried and he didn't get along with the stepmom. But the census records don't entirely substantiate this, and it's difficult with a last name like that, uh, trying to find the right people on the census records and having the census records 
record things correctly. It's a little bit dicey. So the information is, is just unfortunately not real clear. This is his dad, Asmir, uh, his nephew, uh, Phil Selmer. He was particularly close to several of his sisters, and uh, one sister in particular who married a guy named Phil Selmer. Uh, they would be the most frequent visitors to him in Florida. Although he moved away from New Jersey down to Florida to stay, he did go back and visit on occasion, and his family, um, siblings, cousins that would come down and visit as well in Florida. Uh, we think his dad was there at least once from a photo we have of him. This is one of the few photos from up in New Jersey, uh, probably on the beach there on the Jersey Shore. Trapper doesn't smile a lot of photos. <coughs> So as a uh, young adult, he decided to strike out west to do some trapping and get away from the city life. Uh, went with a, his older brother, Charlie, who was about eight, seven or eight years older than him, as I mentioned. Uh, they went all over the west, Arizona, uh, trapping coyotes, raccoons, uh, bobcats, just whatever they could get a hold of out there in the desert. He did some manual labor out in California to earn some money. There's a lot of stories of, you know, hard to substantiate details about his time out west. He supposedly, he supposedly was arrested in Mexico. He had gone down there to just do some trapping over the border and got arrested on suspicion of gun running and then tried to eat the jail out of house and home. So they just said, you know, you're too much trouble, get lost. <laughs> you know, who knows? Not like you're back, not like you're suspecting jail down there. Really great records in that period. Uh, supposedly played cards and traveled as a hobo and so forth. It's, it's a very vague period of his life other than the collection of photos we have from a photo album of his tracking out west. Some more shots out west. Catch the birds they've gotten here. Very chance of this option of uh, Trevor smiling. He's waist deep in a lake here, getting uh, probably a muskrat or a beaver. <laughs> I'll take the audience for the So these are some of the earliest photos of Jupiter. Exactly when he came to Jupiter's a little hazy. It was sometime around 1930. Uh, people's memories of it seem to vary in the telling. Here he is probably with a boy's car box with the eel they caught. There's some stuff out. More trapping on. They were camping on the beach. Jupiter in 1930 was a small hamlet of a few hundred people, an agricultural area. Asparagus plumosa uh, ferneries, dairy farms, some pineapple farms. Not a, not a big place. Did have the room. Here's another shot of his hunt camp, some friends. When he came down here to Florida in 1931, he came with his brother Charlie again, who had trapped with him out west, and then also a friend from Trenton that was about the same age as Trapper named John Dykus. That might be Charlie in the end there, we're, we're still a little unsure. Trapper had a personal scrapbook that he kept of photos, but unfortunately a lot of the photos weren't labeled real well, and so there's some deduction going on about who's who. Trapper and uh, Charlie and John were living on the beach between what's now Carlin Park and Jupiter Beach Park, and at some point there was some disagreement between them and they had a falling out, and Charlie told John to get lost, you know, hand over his share of the, Charlie's share of the money and get lost. And if John just tried to blow the whole thing off, uh, thinking Charlie was just kind of being temperamental, and Charlie threatened to shoot him if he didn't come up with his money in five minutes, and the five minutes passed, and so Charlie walked out there and shot him dead. Trapper was off trapping, you know, checking traps. Charlie decides, no, I just shot a guy, I'm gonna go turn myself into the police. Of course, there was no Jupiter Police Department back then, so we had to drive down to West Palm Beach. He was arrested, uh, put on trial. Uh, Trapper testified against his brother. Trapper and Charlie, by the way, had, uh, it was Vincent and Charlie, uh, had changed their last name from Natalkowitz to Nelson, as had several of their cousins. Uh, something a little more easy to spell and pronounce for people they met. So Charlie is convicted of murder, sent to jail. 
There's a story that as he was, you know, being led away in handcuffs to be sent to Rayford, he, you know, threatened to come back and kill the judge and, and trapper if he ever got out. I haven't found any newspapers in the time period that actually verify that. Trapper did testify against his brother, um, that his brother was temperamental, that uh, some people who knew Trapper said that Trapper's side of the story beyond that was that he basically liked John a bit better than his brother and thought his brother was kind of bossy and was kind of tired of it all and it was sort of a mutual departure uh, had things not turned ugly like they did. So Trapper goes back to New Jersey for a short time and by 1933 is back in the Jupiter area to stay. Uh, it's not in Jupiter proper technically, it's slightly over the Martin County line. Um, it goes up the Laxahatchee River as far as you can reasonably get by a boat. Uh, you can canoe farther, but not, but not really on anything with a motor. He sets up camp there and is initially living in some palmetto shacks, still trapping, but he becomes a his camp quickly becomes a tourist attraction. Here's some early shots of him with some gators. He did not, he quit trapping gators early on. He was told by John and Bessie Du Bois that those gators in the river were going to be a much bigger tourist attraction than he could ever make money from selling their meat and skins, and he took that advice. John and Bessie lived in, the, what's now Du Bois Park in Jupiter was originally a privately owned park. Uh, John and Bessie ran it. Uh, you know, hand, over your, hand over a coin on the weekends to get in to you know, picnic and use the beach. Uh, Bessie had a little restaurant there. Uh, John and Bessie were pioneers of Jupiter and uh, would be instrumental in preserving some of the local history if you're not familiar with them. Here's one of the early shots of Travers Camp. Palmetto shack, some corrugated metal that they slapped together, probably some stuff off the beach. Um, very uh, improvised affair. Another shot of the camp. Some of the, these are some of the animal pens that he kept. Uh, some of it was for things, selling things to tourists. For example, if people kind of go for tourists, and you could buy a gopher tourist if you wanted one as a pet. Uh, or if Trapper was hungry, you could go out there and have dinner fresh on, fresh on the heel. Uh, or as they called it in the 1930s, scuba chickens. Here's another early photo of some visitors at Trapper's camp. Again, a tiny smile, and really he's been well fed. <laughs> Trapper's appetite uh, quickly became legendary, uh, not just from that, but possibly apocryphal jail story. Uh, another time, he went down to Bessie's restaurant to get dinner, and after dinner, Bessie brings out a pie, and there's another person there for dinner, and he cuts a little slice for the gentleman who's there, and Trapper takes the entire rest of the pie. <laughs> Later on, there's a story in the newspaper when Trapper was in the army, and they said, uh, Corporal Nelson clearly wasn't feeling well today. He only ate half a pie in the canteen. <laughs> People who would visit Trapper's camp were well advised to bring a little extra for him. It became a popular thing not just for visitors locally, uh, people coming up from both from Palm Beach or Jupiter Island, uh, but also just local kids with nothing better to do. There was no mall to hang out on. So you'd come up, uh, spend the day at Trappers, take a day, swim, pose for the, with the alligators. Uh, senior skip days from Jupiter School were sometimes spent up here. Nice old fashioned car there in the background. Trapper, of course, was a big, hulking fellow, as we can. <coughs> so, Trapper, of course, is a very imposing figure. Someone who quickly had the idea that this guy would probably be a great boxer. Amateur boxer, perhaps, but it was uh, a bit of an amateur boxing circuit in West Palm Beach at the time. So some people scheduled an amateur battle with him, and Trapper trained in this fashion of beating up sandbags and running through the woods. And Trapper had an amateur fight. It wasn't, wasn't the star of the card, it was just on the undercard. 
and was knocked out in the first round. <laughs> and the, the boxing promoter said, oh, this, this has to be a fluke. We, we found out that this guy he faced while he was an amateur, he had a lot of amateur fights, he was just clearly far too experienced for a trapper's first fight. Let's, let's find you know, a true amateur with no, of, with no fight experience whatsoever, grab this guy from Pahokee, have another undercard match a few weeks later, Trapper gets knocked out in the first round. <laughs> As, as best as the boys can say, Trapper had a glass jaw. There's a patient story that his opponent was a guy named uh, Tiger Long, which, looking in the newspapers, turns out Tiger Long did not, was not a boxer who faced Trapper. He was a contemporary of Trapper's who was actually an early professional wrestler. Trapper probably would have been a good in modern day as well. All right, some more shots of Carol with animals. He was particularly fond of carrying around a big indigo snake on his shoulders. And he, he was a bit of a prankster. He would like to very quietly walk up behind unsuspecting people, especially ladies, pick up the snake, <laughs> put it on their shoulders. Uh, more than one young man at, in Jupiter uh, took a date to Trappers and did not get a second date. <laughs> Now, some of it might, might think was they, would, they were losing the competition to Trapper uh, for the ladies. He was certainly popular with the ladies who swooned over his uh, remarkable physique. But uh, according to a lot of people, he was kind of shy with the ladies, uh, fairly well-mannered, was not. I mean, he was popular with the ladies, but not quite the ladies' man that uh, some people might have imagined. One of the things to add to his popularity, this is the time period when Johnny Weissmuller was starring, starring in all the early Tarzan movies. And Trapper, with his rugged looks, uh, was a spitting image of Tarzan. And so even early on, he was wearing animal skins at the camp to really play it up. Trapper, as I mentioned, was a smart guy, not a lot of schooling, but bright. He was not a bumpkin. He was very annoyed. And if anybody treated him like a savage or a bumpkin, he knew it was an act, he knew it was good business, and he had no problem playing into that. Some of the animal skins I mentioned. And the palmetto shacks here. Someone who really looks like they're having a great kind of crabs. <laughs> More playing with the Tarzan look, popular again. Like I said, the ladies got a little loggerhead turtle skull back here. Some of the uh, popular ladies that I And see your suit, baby. That's the hang out somewhere fun. Now there were alligators uh, that an hour are at the traffic stop sometimes, but I'm sure that the alligators were more afraid of him than they were of uh, than the people were of the alligators. So this is a fun one that turned out recently. having to go to their first funeral like that, 
They take the kids up the river to Trappers so they have a happy memory of the day instead of a sad one. Trapper had kind of a complicated relationship with the kids. Uh, a lot of people felt he didn't really like them, but he was friendly toward them. Uh, he, he, the kids never felt they were unwelcome. He could be stern with people, but uh, a number of people said he was not the type of person to ever yell at anyone. Of course, he was also the type of person that he didn't need to yell. He, he, he could just sort of give it a stern look and, and I think he could understand he'd done something wrong, we're going to do it again. Trapper with what I imagine was not a dog he thought was very bright. Don't quite know why it was in his wrist of bandage up there. There is a story uh, that uh, they've got embellished in the telling, including by Trapper himself. Uh, in 1937, a film crew from some documentary series or newspaper or news or something came and, and interviewed Trapper at his camp, and he was demonstrating something with rattlesnakes, and one of the rattlesnakes bit him in the thumb. And Trapper tried to, you know, suck out the venom, shrug it off, but he, he became a little woozy and they ended up taking him to the hospital. Well, it was no, no big deal um, in, in the very soon of things, but he liked to embellish the, the retelling of it that he, you know, he'd manly chop off at the end of his thumb with an axe and just continued on with nothing that happened. Uh, he also turned into a bit of, again, a bit of his uh, sense of humor. He would use this story as an instructional tool for uh, talking. He talked to like a group of Boy Scouts. And he explained about you know safety handling of animals, and then would tell the story about you know getting bit in the thumb and having to chop it off, and then he'd say, and so if a snake gets you uh, somewhere down low, you know what to do. <laughs> this is a guy named Joe Farrell. He was a uh, runaway from Brooklyn, New York, all they saw. Top of the time machine. One of Trapper's good buddies was 
uh, everyone called him Captain Frank. In fact, if you ever read the Locks of Hatchie Lament, you'll be very confused because half a dozen people will mention Captain Frank and no one will take the time to explain who the heck he was. He it was, his full name was Frank Lightliner. He was a bachelor uh, boat owner. He smoked his pipe on a regular basis. Uh, ever present. He was one of the first people to start taking people up every weekend to Sea Trapper as a tourist attraction. And they were buddies, they were both bachelors, they loved the outdoors. Um, good, rare time of travel, I'm sure. Captain Frank, uh, in the 50s or 60s, got lung cancer from his near constant smoking habit. And uh, it was a, a big emotional loss for Trapper, for one thing, but also thought to be one of the things that sort of put Trapper in a, a real negative mindset about cancer, which we'll, we'll come back to in a little bit. Another one of the shanties at the Trapper's place, one of his wood piles. A little slight improvements here, we've gone through metal for the roofs instead of entirely being made out of palmettos. physical shape. Some people said he was 6'4", his draft card said 6'2". Uh, when he was boxing, he was 195 pounds. By the time World War II rolled around, he was up to 215. Uh, later in life, he would uh, pack on a little bit more weight and go up to 240, but at this point, he was pretty much all muscle. Uh, he would run and swim and just, you know, walk out to check his traps on a daily basis for exercise. He chopped a cord of wood every day as exercise. He had no shortage of firewood, some of which is made of soul later today. Uh, one of his policies was he would always go out, he would check, he would set his traps and he would always go out and check them every day. He was not someone who wanted to leave animals suffering in the traps. Part of it was a humanity, he just didn't want animals to suffer needlessly. Uh, also, some of it was pragmatic. Uh, if he's trying to sell something for the, the fur, if the animal is stuck in the trap for a while, it struggles, it damages the fur, so it's bad for business as well. Uh, Trapper was fond of going around barefoot in camp when he was going out to check the traps. He usually did wear snake boots, although he sliced, he made a big slash in one side of the snake boots. And so one of his nephews was helping out one time. He's like, Trapper, why are you going to make hole in the side of your boots? He's like, trust me, you'll, you'll understand in a little while. And so they go out there in their snake boots checking traps, and after a little while, they're just, you know, it's the summer, so they are just drenched in sweat. And the, the nephew realizes that the slashes in the side of the snake boots, all the sweat pours out, otherwise you'd be walking around in a couple gallons of your own sweat. <laughs> this is Lucille G. Nelson, um, Trapper's only wife, uh, not a especially happier, long-lived marriage. The story that's circulated for a long time is that Trapper married her thinking he could get out of being drafted for World War II. <laughs> Looking at the recent, a little more into the records, it reveals that with the story has actually been backwards of what we always thought. Trapper was drafted on May 1st, 1942. He married four days later. So probably what it was is Lucille's like, oh, I, I can take care of your camp while you're gone. Uh, or, or something to that effect. The trapper was worried about his camp and uh, that fact of the decision when he couldn't avoid getting drafted. He did try to avoid getting drafted. He wasn't really keen uh, on going in. Lucille, uh, besides, I mean, she worked out at the place called the 19th Hole in Lake Park. Uh, trapper 
Or is this the number two out of three and a half? Uh, I say three and a half, not because she just numbered her last husband. Um, she, tra her and Trapper were divorced in 44. She remarried us uh, to a third guy. They divorced. When she tried to get remarried, when she tried to marry the fourth guy, it was in Florida, and they said, oh no, you don't have a clean divorce. Uh, and then she later tried to come back when Trapper died and said, oh, uh, I, I should be getting some money as the wife. Like, well, you either married someone else because you thought you were divorced or you were committing, you were committing bigamy, or we have a problem here. So it, it was it was one of those things that uh, she was good at raising trouble, you might say. Beyond her, we really don't know too much about Trapper's, uh, what you might say, personal love life. Uh, he had some girlfriends, none of which, as far as we know, got too close to being married. Married. Um, someone actually just told me recently, though, they said that, that I think it was their, their mother, their grandmother, uh, Trapper was very sweet on, but she wasn't willing to get married and come live at the camp, so it never uh, went too far. This is sometime in the early 1940s. They've built the two cabins here that people associate with this camp because they're still there today. This was really at the point when he had enough money and uh, enough confidence that he was going to be there long term to build one for himself and one as a guest cabin. Uh, this was right after the Depression, and Trapper had a steady source of income from tourists coming in and selling, selling animals to zoos, selling skins uh, and fur. So he started buying up delinquent tax sale land. If the, when, during the Depression, you couldn't pay your taxes. After a certain number of years, the government would auction off your property, and you could someone could buy that property if they were to pay off all the delinquent taxes that were owed, and then met the tax sale taxes due for the next I think three years. And then after that, after that point, you basically got land for dirt, relatively dirt cheap. So Trapper bought a lot of land around his camp, it ended up being hundreds of acres uh, by the end of the Depression. Here's another shot, probably the, after, probably after World War II. Some of the, he started upgrading again some of the buildings, the Paul, Palmetto shacks were going away. Now, Trevor did serve in World War II. He got, as I mentioned, he got drafted, uh, went to basic training in Camp Blanding up near Jacksonville, then got sent to Keesler Air Force Base in Mississippi to be trained, of all things, as an aviation mechanic. Somehow got some kind of leg injury there, and someone he knew from uh, Jupiter Island, uh, a guy named Joseph Reed, Nat Reed's father. He was in, he was getting involved with the military uh, on the civilian side and pulled some strings and got Trapper sent down to this new place called Camp Murphy. We know it today's job in the Houston State Park. It was the Southern Signal Corps school where they're training people in radar units and. Uh, Joseph Reed became a captain in the army and was in charge of kind of providing the, the lifestyle stuff for the uh, people stationed there, uh, made arrangements for Jupiter Island, the officers could live on homes on the island, uh, that they could use the Jupiter Island Club as an officer's club, they could bring, had a ferry going to bring men back and forth from the island to use the beach and things like that. So Trapper gets assigned to the camp, really the place he could do the most good. You know, it was a cushy job for him, but it was also the place he could do the most good. You're sticking with thousands of people in temporary buildings in the scrub of Florida. You need to deal with all the snakes that are getting in there, and the spiders, and, and goodness knows what other problems they might have, uh, as well as doing just some basic security patrols. So pretty, pretty good job for Trapper for a couple of years. Uh, we don't know quite what he did during the last about nine months he was in the service after the camp closed down. He was discharged from another Signal Corps camp up in uh, Missouri called Camp Crowder in 1945. And then came back, uh, bought a couple surplus army jeeps. Here's one of his uh, jeeps. Lovely bunch of coconuts. Always looking, always looking for a good business opportunity. Here's Trapper with his garage that he built, again with one of the Jeeps, uh, his brother-in-law. Here's another shot of Trapper's dock, with a lot of people want to sue off of. Again, always a cheery fellow. Uh, after the war, he also upgraded the animal pens, going through the old log stockades so that 
chain link, uh, which was also better for visitors. They could come up and look in there and see the bobcats and the alligators and so forth. Also decreased the chances that somebody maybe you know, brought a, a few too many beers in their picnic lunch and then you, know, you didn't want someone to fall in there with the alligators. Bad for business. Apparently we're visiting with some locals. Apparently some apparently like your smile on the face. Again, maybe they, maybe they just provided this kind of lunch. He had a little uh, herd of goats apparently. He had a little petty zoo. He also had these things are not chickens, these are something called guinea fowl. Uh, they're an African relative of a chicken, but they're bigger, noisier, and mean-tempered. Uh, Trapper kept a little flock of them around. Uh, they doubled as his uh, security system. It was hard to uh, show up at his camp unannounced without uh, triggering the guinea fowl to just completely raise the racket. They'll come in the border later. This is one of his sisters on a visit. Here's the inside of the cabin seat. Uh, you know, he didn't have electricity out there, he had a generator, he had some uh, creature comforts of home in the inside. He did have some problems over the years renting them out. Uh, over Sometimes, you know, it was laid back, he had the most poker games uh, with people from Palm Beach. Uh, always playing the house, good way to make money. Uh, over time, though, people got a little more rowdy sometimes, partying a little too hard, had some trouble. With them. Uh, became reluctant to rent things out other than the close friends and family. A guy named Bruce Collier, uh, he and his mother started running a ferry service in the 40s between Palm Beach Island and West Palm Beach, and they also soon came out with a bright idea that we'd run a jungle cruise every weekend from Palm Beach up to Travers. Uh, and so that was regular visitors all the way up there until Trapper closed his camp. Nice boat they had. Another shot, uh, this is the jungle goddess, is what the boat they use. The towering cypress in the area. If you've never been up there, uh, it's, it's a nice trip up the river now, uh, but if you go up there or have been up there, Think of how much, how many mangroves line the, uh, the way up there, and then imagine if those were all cypresses instead. Because that's what it used to be before they had salt water and fusion problems up the river. Again, Trapper, a businessman, made a series of postcards to advertise himself, had his own business card. Anything you could possibly want from the woods? Even kept a P.O. box in Jupiter. So in 1960, Trapper has decided decides to close his camp. Uh, he's had some issues with uh, the facilities and people, code compliance issues. He built some bathrooms, which are still in use today. Uh, there were some issues with that. There were some issues with the animal pins and what happened to the, the waste when he closed them out. Uh, variety of problems. Just more, uh, more people coming up there being a little too difficult for him. Uh, and he just decided, you know, it's not worth the trouble anymore. I'm just going to close the camp. And so one day he said, that's it, nobody's welcome up here anymore. Uh, cut down some logs across the Loxahatchee River to block anything but a, really a small canoe. Now, it wasn't completely cut off from the outside world. His family would still visit. Uh, you could still go into town sometimes, talk to some people he knew. Uh, if you wanted to see him, you could make arrangements, like you'd send him a postcard, he'd agree to meet you. But he started going around. Uh, he had a never-present double-barreled shotgun with him. If you showed up at his gate unannounced, Trapper would show up very shortly thereafter with the shotgun at the ready. Um, no evidence that he ever actually shot any intruders with it, but he certainly pointed at quite a few of them. Uh, a couple of people, he, he became kind of rough and unfriendly toward people that were just merely acquaintances or, or complete strangers. He was still, you know, decently friendly with the people he'd known for a long time. He was still close to, he still liked. Here is the village. This is now a River's Edge subdivision uh, up off of Loxahatch River Road. This is a little bridge that used to be able to drive up Loxahatch River Road all the way to Trapper's Camp. Uh, it was a dirt road. 
some of the locals with trucks got the bright idea that people got stuck in that sand quite a bit when they go up there on the weekend. So if you had a good truck, you just hang out there for uh, on uh, Saturday or Sunday, but eventually someone gets stuck and then they pay you to tow them out. <laughs> but again, the how how the development look of all these this pine flat with This is Scrapper in his later years. He's put on some weight, quite, not quite the uh, cars in anymore. Trapper with a very rare sight of with a beard. He was almost always clean shaven. And the story I found up on in this photo, in 1959, Jupiter celebrated a centennial, not a centennial of the town itself, but of the lighthouse. They were off by a year, and then stopped. Everyone was, all the men in town were required to grow beards. And if you didn't grow beard, you would be sort of punished by a mock kangaroo court. Uh, they do various things like, you know, putting you in the, putting you in the stocks. Uh, they did that Perry Polo, who had a home in the colony. He, of course, was clean shaven for his TV show. He comes home. Uh, they show up at his house to arrest him. Uh, Perry was just sport about the whole thing, posed for photos. They let, they let him take a minute to uh, get punished. Everyone had a very old time with that. This is the last known photo of Trapper Nelson alive. Uh, this is his niece, or grandniece, I guess. Uh, he's reclining on a bench here under his uh, big camping. People call it a cheeky, it was more like a, a large corrugated roof uh, picnic shelter. Uh, the scouts would stay up there in the loft, for example. Uh, a lot of open, shaded space underneath. This was taken about six or eight months uh, before he died. In the summer of 1968, uh, July, late July, I forget the exact date, Trapper was had an appointment to meet with an old friend who was, who was on the way, he was down visiting in Florida, went to see Trapper, had made an appointment with him, and then Trapper doesn't show up in town to pick the guy up. And John Du Bois goes, well, that's very odd. You know, Trapper's a bit prodigy these days, but he never misses appointments with anybody. So John being one of the only people that was still on, really close with Trapper besides his family and who actually had a key to his gate, drives up to check on Trapper, especially because he knew, you know, tra last time Trapper was in town, wasn't feeling too well. Oh, hopefully nothing's wrong. Goes up there and, well, something's very wrong. Trapper is face down dead underneath this picnic shelter. Uh, John has to drive back to town. Trapper doesn't have a phone. Call from the Boys Park. Trapper lived over the county line, so he's got to call the Martin County Sheriff's Department. Martin County Sheriff's Department comes back. I go investigate the scene. He required. In, when I first did this presentation on request back in July, I read among my research was reading the entire 90-page coroner's report on this whole thing. So, a lot of interesting reading. Trapper was found face down on the ground, arms underneath of him. His ever-present double-barrel shotgun was lying behind him with the butt of the gun either just under his ankle or just behind his ankle, the, uh, depending on who, who you hear, they don't remember quite the same. Uh, he had one bullet right about here in the chest, went in, um, almost straight in, didn't come out, uh, nicked the lung, nicked, nicked the rib, uh, more importantly, Nick clipped his heart, and so probably killed him pretty quickly. The ruling was suicide. Uh, there was people. There are people to this day who dispute that ruling. Uh, let me lay out sort of the, the different evidence of, of possibilities. Number one is people that able to a lot of people want to believe that it was murder. Uh, murder, I think, is just because you don't want to imagine someone like Trapper dying in anything other than some, he was a grand, larger than life figure. Probably, you know, the, the largest living legend figured literally and figuratively in Jupiter history. You don't want to imagine someone like that dying, you know, quietly in a bed or, or offing themselves. You want to imagine, you know, a grand person like that going out in a grand way. Um, obvious choice that people want to latch on to was his brother, Charlie. Charlie is out of prison and back for revenge. Charlie had been out of prison for 17 years. Uh, nobody knew his whereabouts. We still don't know to this day what happened to Charlie Nelson. It's not a name that's easy to track down. If you, Charlie, no middle name Nelson. Um, 
somewhere out there. Uh, if, you want, if you want to be an amateur detective, that's a great lead to pursue. Uh, but he'd been out of prison for 17 years. There was, Trapper was not a hard person to find. There was no reason to wait. Uh, more importantly, Charlie was about 70 at the time. Uh, when his family had last seen him, they described him as a broken down old man who had been beaten in prison. The Florida State Penitentiary back then was not a place you wanted to be. That was often pretty brutal. So Charlie has a motive, but the, other than that, does not really thing seem to add up. Um, another example, people want to connect it to uh, the murder of Judge Chillingworth. For those of you who don't know the story, Judge Chillingworth was a judge in Palm Beach County, and he found out that another one of the judges in Palm Beach County, Judge Peel, was just completely corrupt. He was going to have Judge Peel disbarred, but he made the mistake of telling Judge Peel that he was going to be disbarred. Well, Judge Peel was such a crooked guy, he said, I'm going to hire two guys to kill Judge Chillingworth, and then I won't get disbarred. So, Chillingworth disappears, uh, and some years later, someone gets drunk in a bar and blabs a little too much that they were the guy who off Judge Chillingworth. And it turns out that Peel hired two guys who kidnapped Judge Chillingworth and his wife, took him out on a boat, and uh, let them take a long swim with cement shoes. The connection to Trapper is that Trapper and Chillingworth knew each other, they sometimes played poker together, and they both were involved in acquiring land in the 30s up along the Latsahatchee River. That's about it. Uh, they died 13 years apart. Uh, there's no evidence that Trapper knew Peel or had, was any way involved in the case. Uh, that didn't stop someone uh, recently from writing a fiction book in which Trapper appears as a character and having that be involved in the story, but uh, it's a good story that doesn't really pan out. Uh, some people want to say it was, a, it was a jealous lover. Someone found out that a, a, a lady was cheating on her husband with Trapper, and ah, uh, that's, well, again, it's, you know, we, uh, you saw a photo of what Trapper looked like in the later years. Uh, if someone was going to cheat up with Trapper uh, and, and make someone, their husband, very jealous, it would have happened, I think, probably about a decade or two prior. Um, so, we can't rule out completely, but it's not a real strong argument. Uh, Trapper had problems with various local hooligans. There's a few families who had very unruly, all their children were very unruly uh, and, and vicious and bullies uh, in the Jupiter area at the time. And some of them harassed Trapper and had a few incidences of, of people giving him a hard time. But that's the kind of thing where you don't, if you're trying, if you go and you murder Trapper Nelson to prove you're a tough guy, what, what good does it do if nobody knows it? Nobody, nobody's ever, oh, Johnny Boy, that guy was always, he told me over 12 beers that he was the guy who off Trapper Nelson. There's, I haven't heard any, any kind of story like that. So again, it's, it's, a, it's a fine theory, but there's no meat behind it. Um, the best, if you, if you want to latch, latch onto some kind of conspiracy theory about a murder, uh, real estate is probably the best option. Trapper had a bunch of real estate. Uh, he had some financial issues that led him to get a, he ended up with a predatory loan on some money that he had to sell off real estate he had and later became part of Dequesta. It was developed for a couple subdivisions there. Uh, really didn't much care for the bankers after that one. And, you know, there's people who, various whispers about people who coveted Trapper's land uh, or that were involved in what eventually happened with Trapper's land being swapped for some, another development that I'll, I'll explain in a moment. Uh, that, that some kind of real estate related conspiracy that, you know, they didn't want Trapper's land to become part of the state park or they wanted it to be swapped for some other land. Uh, again, I, it's a fine theory. I, I've heard a few people name names uh, on who they think done it. Uh, but again, it's all circumstantial uh, without any real evidence to back it up other than, well, they had a motive. Um, the other thing is, even though Trapper wasn't too well, these days, uh, at the time of his death, he had he'd been um, he'd been using a catheter for a couple months. He'd been very sick. He w told people he was concerned he had cancer, which because of people he knew who like Captain Frank who died from cancer, he was very uh, negative about that. He didn't want people to cut. He didn't want doctors to cut into him. Uh, didn't trust doctors very much. So, you know, not doing well. So that, you know, obviously that brings us to the suicide option. The explanation that they was put forward by the deputies 
trapper took, put the butt of the gun on the ground, leaned forward a bit, leaned the gun against him, and reached down and pulled the trigger. He was shot definitely by his own gun. It was not uh, shot, it was a slug that was, that was used in the gun. Um, it was a slug that the trapper had purchased himself. So they, you know, it fit for that. Uh, someone said, oh, this is, this is an odd way to shoot yourself. But uh, the deputy said, you know, I'm 5'11", and, and the way I described it, I could off myself with this gun. Trapper was 6'2", and had long arms. He could definitely have, you know, physically done it. Uh, there's the argument that uh, some people want to say Trapper was not the kind of person to off themselves. On the other hand, there's other people who will give the exact opposite, saying Trapper did not want to be a burden on anybody. Trapper lived by himself. Trapper was, had said that if he couldn't take care of himself and live the way he wanted, that he would end his life. Um, what the, his, the niece, the grandniece that's pictured in this photo, as, as she put it, when we heard about Trapper's death, we were sad, but we weren't surprised. Uh, it's an unfortunate thing, and, but it, it's not unreasonable. Uh, there's also one of our kind of arguments we've been put forward is, while Trapper has almost worked out this deal with the state uh, to have his land taken, become as part of the state park, get some money, uh, he would be set for life, he'd have a home estate. Uh, you know, why would someone who's about to be set kill themselves? Well, sometimes just the, the stress of the changes, um, you know, even if it seems to be changes for good is what does seem to push some people over the edge. Uh, there's also the matter that regardless of what Trapper might be set financially for life with any deal he worked out with the state, which had not been finalized at the time of his death, uh, the problem is the world had changed a lot about Trapper. And I don't just mean the wider world, technology, or things like that. I mean Jupiter itself. Uh-oh. Oh, we're taking a nap here. So, Jupiter had changed a lot from the time Trapper had been there a few decades earlier. Uh, by the time, by the 1960s when they roll around, you have Pratt Whitney out west. You have, instead of a one-lane gravel road to get to uh, Indian Town from Jupiter, you have a paved road and you have the Beeline Highway. You have Jupiter as a suddenly growing town. They're, they're closing up all these agricultural lands and building subdivisions there. A lot of things are changing in the world just around Trapper as Jupiter's growing, and you know, it, it wasn't really, you know, he, his family said that sometimes he just wanted to maybe sell off everything and go out west somewhere that was still remote and, you know, go back to where the way he used to, the world had used to be for him. Um, he, he wasn't real happy with how some of the things had changed. So that factors into it. One of the, uh, of course, then there's the, the third theory, which has been put forth by several people who knew Trapper, uh, several rangers who worked at the park, and that is simply, it was an accident. Trapper is, feel, is not feeling well. He's medicated. He's paranoid. He's sleeping out in the, in the summer to where it's a little cooler than in his cabin with a gun. Uh, something happens in the night. He hears a noise that startles him awake. He, you know, stumbles out of the, of the hammock he was sleeping in, fumbles for his gun, gun goes off accidentally. Could be. Uh, fits a lot of the things. And to end this on a little off, more upbeat note, there are a ranger did point put forth a uh, fourth theory, which I, I think is a, an interesting theory in its own right. After all these years, one of those raccoons finally had his revenge. <laughs> Uh, the problem was, is, so he had three heirs to his property, uh, none of whom were really in the state to live on it, uh, none of whom could really afford to pay taxes on it, uh, with a growing real estate in the area. But there were some people who, uh, ironically, the real estate developers, they were surprisingly enough not interested in Trapper's property. Nowadays, people would jump on the chance to develop waterfront property in the Loxahatchee River. But instead of that, they wanted, no, 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 we want the southeast corner of Jonathan Dickinson State Park. We think it would be a great place for a golf course. So the state could not legally sell off part of a state park, but the state could legally do a land swap. So how it worked out, these developers bought Trapper's 800 some acres from on the south side of the Loxahatchee River from his heirs. They then swapped 800 acres there 
for about 350 acres that's now Jupiter Hills Country Club, which was originally part of the state park, uh, which at the time was valued at the same amount of money uh, by, by the property appraiser. And that money, that they swapped that for the state park, and that's how the state park got the south bank of the Lox Hatchery River and can preserve it from being developed. And by acquiring that land to the state park, uh, it helped persuade John and D. MacArthur to later sell the rest of the upriver part of the Northwest Fork to the South Florida Water Management District instead of developing it like he'd originally wanted to. And as a result, we now have, in 1985, the wild, National Wild and Sink designation for the Loxahatchee River, which wouldn't have happened if it had been sold off and developed. All right, so I mentioned Trapper had a large flock of not only chickens and guinea fowl, and I'm not kidding about a large flock there. Uh, here's how close in the camp can become. Uh, if you visit it, you see it's much more open today. One of the problems with the crime scene, uh, there's some of the stories that circulate, you might read in an article, is, oh, a trapper had only been thought to be dead for a couple days. According to the coroner's, juror, ju uh, the cor the coroner's report, he said trapper had been dead as much as two weeks. They could narrow it down to five to seven days simply because someone had seen him alive that recently. Uh, the body was in such a terrible state from being, you know, in the summer heat uh, out there in the open that they had to do the autopsy at Martin Memorial Hospital outdoors because of the smell. It was, it was really nasty. Uh, the, to make matters worse, all these pens had, they, 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 could, they didn't know what a dead body was, but when the maggots showed up, they knew lunch was served. And so the, 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 the guinea fowl and the chickens had been all over the body, just completely ruined the crime scene by the time the police were there. So that's one of the reasons it's hard to uh, tell really what happened. Some, some people have raised suspicions, oh, they couldn't get any prints off of Trapper's gun. Again, with all the, the disturbance from the birds and lying out in the, in the summer in Florida for five days, I asked a friend of mine who worked in crime scene investigation for a number of years, uh, it's not that surprising. So Trapper's camp, when it was found, the cabins were locked. He did have some loaded guns inside. Uh, but things were not initially, we were initially in good shape. But as word got out, the trapper was dead. The poachers moved in. The vandals moved in. Uh, people showed up going, I bet Trapper's got buried treasure around here. So they dug up the camp. Uh, they did have a section in his pineapple patch. They had a sign that said, warning landmines. Uh, he wasn't entirely kidding. He didn't have actual landmines, but he did have a few conveniently placed bear traps. Next best thing. Uh, a lot of stuff was just, you know, we don't know. He, he had a large collection of, he read a lot of those magazines and newspapers, so, you know, his lifetime subscription to the Wall Street Journal was scattered all over the place. Soon as those will be lost in there. Uh, probably a lot of his personal correspondence that would have been really helpful to have. Um, he had three rows that were all sold or sunk. Uh, one of his Jeeps was destroyed, the garage was burned down. Uh, if you go to Trappers today, there is one of the Jeeps on display. It's only there because it was in the garage in Jupiter getting worked on at the time of his death. Fortunately, the cabin survived, uh, and the state was able to get in there and start doing law enforcement and, and save anything else from being destroyed. So this is a rough, this is a very rough outline. This is what happens when you draw a mask and a paint. This is approximately Trapper's property here, probably a little bit up here as well. This is what added substantially to Jonathan Dickinson State Park. Uh, we had owned the property over here and had it sold in the 60s, and then Jupiter Hills Country Club is over here between the railroad and US 1. Uh, that, that's the last community there before you get to the State Park if you're driving north to Cuesta. And then this red line is the Lacta Country River. You can paddle if you're if you're uh, uh, up for it. It's a bit of a long, but very scenic paddle down the Lackawanna River here, and the river still to this day winds up with trappers. Uh, alternatively, you can put in uh, your own boat or kayak, or if the tide and the water levels right, you can go to the state park and they have a uh, ferry that will take you up a little river cruise and stops the trappers, and a ranger will give you a tour of the site. If you've never done it, it's definitely worth it. Here's a modern photo of Trapper's camp with the cabins that have been restored. Uh, this water cabin, this water pump. Back in the 1980s, they were doing some repairs on one of his fireplaces. 
And lo and behold, they found a, a little soft spot in the, some of the putty, mm -hmm. and they found a box of coins that it was Trapper's little piggy bank. Um, hundreds of coins worth thousands of dollars he'd accumulated over a very long period of time, uh, collecting his a little admission fee to go to his camp. So this presentation, I have to, of course, most of all thank the Selmer family who have done a lot over the years to uh, share Trapper's memory, both their experiences at uh, the camp and him as a person, and quite a lot of photos. Uh, Jim Snyder wrote Life and Death on the Loxahatchee. The revised edition is good reading, uh, really the best thing in print on Trapper's life. Uh, Bill and Frank Lund, uh, Frank Lund from his personal reminiscence he shared, Bill Lund uh, was the leading advocate for the preservation of the Loxahatchee River, and there is that. <laughs> Uh, Trapper Road believes that the failure of technology. I'm up here uh, thanks to the Historical Society. There's some information in the back about our Historical Society membership, things like that. Also, a handout with my presentations coming up. There'll be 10 of them. Uh, this is the only one up here in Stewart, but if you're willing to travel a little farther south uh, to see some more of them uh, between now and April. Uh, like the Stewart Heritage Museum, we do have volunteers down there that help us with events and the museum and the daily visitors to the lighthouse, uh, if you're interested in that sort of thing. But I'm happy here at the end to open up to questions, people who, if anybody is alive that met, that's here tonight that met Trapper, um, and any questions you might have. Oh, I guess we went down there in 56, I think, and he was wearing a pith helmet and khaki shorts. That was it. The classic look of all the khaki shorts in the 50s. What was your impression of Oh, we, we went in by car from Jupiter. It was a dirt road in there, sand trail. And um, he was just standing around there. Oh. <laughs> nothing, nothing exciting. Sort of like Tarzan or something, by the <laughs> movies. One of, one of the, my favorite things I ever had someone tell me what their impression of this trapper, uh, guy said, Trapper had the largest hands of any man I've ever met in my life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, the case of the coroner's report, did they ever say what he physically was wrong with him, that he was sick? They did not. The coroner's report, they said they did not find any evidence of widespread cancer, uh, although given the state of some of his organs, it would have been hard to tell. Uh, it's one of those things that you know, he may not have had cancer, quite possibly, but uh, the fact that he thought he had cancer was the most important thing. That's, that's the, tr the important thing to remember with history. You have, you have two lines of thought in history. There's what happened and what people thought happened and how that shaped their decision making. Sometimes people made very important decisions and so, unfortunately sometimes fatal decisions based on incorrect beliefs or bad information they were working off of. I did have more than a few interactions with Trapp and Nelson. I was a teenager at the time, and our swimming coach would take us up there by car on weekends from West Palm. And uh, I, I think what I would describe him as, he was a recluse that didn't like to be alone. <laughs> uh, he didn't interact with us a lot, but he liked to watch what we were doing. And uh, I noticed you didn't have a picture of one of the things that stood out in my mind. When you pulled in the area there where you could park at his place, he had an eight by four sheet of plywood. <clears throat> and painted on the plywood, very succinctly, it said, I'm not responsible for anything that happens to you. <laughs> <laughs> and I could understand why. He let you pretty well run around all over the place. But he hadn't cleaned out any of the poison ivy or poison oak. It was where it was supposed to be, and if you were dumb enough to get into it, <laughs> itch, baby, itch. <laughs> He'd let you get up on the roof of the boathouse, slide down it, run down it into the river. Uh, the 
swing, of course, was there. And I mean, he pretty well let kids just go be kids. But he didn't assume any responsibility. <laughs> I definitely get the impression that Trapper who around there needs something wrong. You just look at it and go, yeah, you should have done that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I uh, know a few people that you're talking about. Uh, someone who didn't, didn't like people but didn't want to be alone. Uh, I know some people like that who you might describe as they're introverts, but they like people watching. So maybe Trapper was one of those. like the Chicago Mafia come down and, and hide out in his cabins because it was such a remote area. Did you, have you saw any um, <laughs> evidence of that in anything that you've read or seen about him? Any evidence of Mafia connections or Mafia staying in his camp? Uh, I think this is the first I've heard of it. And usually when I hear about the Mafia in Jupiter, it's people claiming that uh, Al Capone hid out in Jupiter Farms in the 20s during Prohibition. Um, it's certainly the kind of story that gets a lot of legs and runs, uh, but I've never seen anything to substantiate uh, a connection with Al Capone and the Jupiter Farms or with the Chicago Mafia and Trappers. So I'm, I'm not saying it didn't happen, I'm saying I've never seen any evidence one way or the other. Anybody else? All right, well, thank you.